Welcome. My name is Rikka Puurunen. I'm a professor of catalysis science and technology at Aalto University since about one and a half years. And uh, I've been working with atomic layer deposition for 20 years since I did my master's thesis on the topic. That was on catalysis. Then I have uh, moved, I have been uh, postdoc at IMEC, Inter-University Microelectronics Center in Belgium, and in PPP for a long time and now back at Aalto University. And I aim to use ALD for catalyst applications. Shall we switch this thing off because it's distracting light? And uh, I was invited by Simo-Pekka Hanula to give a lecture in this functional materials course. So I created this lecture. It's a new one and uh, I think that I will be updating this lecture I have been invited to give an ALD lecture at Aalto University earlier, but I didn't have time. A new professor has so many things to do that then I had to say no, but now I thought I really have to say yes. And uh, I've prepared this with the knowledge that I have, thinking of what you would like to know, thinking also what the people who start working with ALD would need to know, what to teach them. So there might be a bit too much content for you. Don't think that you need to know everything by heart. Don't, don't think of that. So I will go through principles and concepts that I consider important for ALV. I will go through some history and applications and words on the future. But before we go to the prepared lecture, what do you already know about ALV? Would somebody like to say? But it is like a coating mechanism with very conformal coating and you have like series of gases inflows uh, with the help of purging gas so you remove the extra, extra reactants and you have like one mono there at every step. So you have really learned something about ALD. You mentioned the conformality and the stepwise processing. You mentioned also monolayer. I will come back to that okay. in the lecture. Anybody else who has some uh, Contact with ALB earlier. Yeah, that was quite a lot already. And I will also explain what I have here. So I'm creating a one of the record of the lecture to be shared uh, within all the university later. Um, would something happen during the class that we don't want to be in the lecture? We can cut it out. So don't be afraid to speak. Um, I've done this already in the spring and students have liked this and I also will share this then more, more openly and we didn't really meet such situations last spring that you would need to remove contents but it's possible. Where can, a can one find ALD films in practice? Do you have any view on this? So I have a project on biosenders and there I think an aluminium oxide layer was produced by AOD. That's basically all I know about AOD so far. <laughs> aluminium oxide yeah. is the most studied process. It must have been the trimethyl aluminium water process. And that was for scientific research, yeah. right? Where can we find it in our everyday life? In the uh, in electronic devices, like the chip manufacturing. Yeah, like that computer and that computer and this mobile phone and this mobile phone and that mobile phone. It's there. It's invisible, like it is invisible here, but it's there. And uh, well, thanks to thanks to this one, people start to know about it, that. So this year. Thomas Untala, who invented ALD in 1974, received the Millennium Technology Prize for the invention. It's worth 1 million euros. It's given every second year. And the previous winner was this lady who got the Nobel Prize this year. Yeah. So this is helping to communicate to people that you have it in your mobile phone. Um, yeah. Connections between lectures, this is what I found in the my courses. Does it, is it accurate? Yeah. I was thinking, where do we have ALD here? You know, of course, in my lecture, but do the others have any? 
And I don't know the contents, but I was thinking that there could be in many of those. There was one, Saima Ali from uh, Microchemistry, she works in a company that does ALD. And what I see from the applications, there are several lectures where there could have been. Okay. Expected learning outcomes. I think this is a useful one for this lecture because there are maybe a bit too many contents otherwise. But I hope that after this you can describe the principles of ALD. One person already knew. This is something that if you have an exam it might very well be asked. And uh, I hope that you will beware. be aware of the history of ALD and the two independent discoveries that you probably don't know yet about. And you can name some applications where ALD is used. Let's go to the principles and contents. And we also need to watch the watch a little bit. I might have far too many things here. So I uh, will be following actually uh, my own review from 2005 quite a lot. Um, I wrote it uh, when I was a postdoctoral student or researcher at IMEC, and I wrote it in the way what I wished that would have been available when I started with ALD. There was no such review then, so I have gone through the uh, concepts, for example, and uh, reviewed the literature, and uh, I have been really happy with people coming to thank me at conferences for this review. I'm quite known in the field of ALD, and that's thanks to this review. And one US professor, uh, Neil Daskupta, told me that he's using the review already in second generation. When he learned ALD, he was given this review to learn ALD from. And now he's a professor and he gives the review for his students to learn ALD. So that's something that makes me feel very, very, like, it, it was not wasted time. And uh, so it is being used to teach ALD, and I also use it here for the same purpose. So how is ALD defined? Um, for that review, I was looking for a definition and I couldn't find one. And then I thought that, especially when you do modeling, you, you need to have a definition to, to set the frames of what you are doing. And this is what I came up with. ALD can be defined as a film deposition technique that is based on the sequential use of self-terminating gas solid reactions. I say can be defined, and that's because it was not defined like that. That's a de definition that I have created. But that's on the basis of merging all the knowledge that I knew from everything that I have read. And uh, this definition has been picked up by others also. And also criticized, but that's the good thing. When you write things down, then you can really start discussing the contents. So sequential use, the cycles, of self-terminating re uh, reactions. It means that, uh, well, here is an example of, uh, of a model cycle in a way. You have some substrate. Um, it could be a silicon wafer. It could be porous powder. It could be, well, what was that that you were working with? That was biosensors. Biosensors, yeah. It can be anything, but it needs to have something on the surface that is able to react with that compound that you bring through the gas phase to the surface. And the reaction has to be such that it stops by itself. That's why it's called self-terminating here. And then you create this, what you would think, of a monolayer. So when, when you have filled the surface, there's no more reaction happening. Then you uh, move to the next step with, with a purge or evacuation in between. And you need to have at least typically two compounds that are compatible in the way that you react one to the surface, you purge the extras, you bring in the next one, you purge the extras, these react with each other and build a material. So uh, not all chemicals, of course, will build this criteria. And I have here, as, yeah, here is the picture of what, what this self-terminating means. Well, it means that if you look at the amount of material absorbed, as function of time, uh, you increase, and then you level to some amount. And then after you stop uh, feeding the compound, that still stays. I have here a little bit 
uh, still more. Yeah, so if you are if you want to put it in the usual chemical terms, self-terminating is not the usual chemical term, but it's saturating and it's irreversible. These are terms that we are very, very familiar with. And then I have ha here examples of what is not fulfilling the criteria. So if you would have continuous uh, deposition, like you would have in chemical vapor deposition typically, you don't have that leveling off by itself. That doesn't fulfill the criteria. Or if you are not waiting enough, that you have levels off with the amount. That's also, well, it can, the reactions can maybe fulfill the criteria, but the process doesn't do that yet. And then there is an example where you have desorption of the species from the surface when you start purging. Those are all ways to uh, deviate from the principles. Ah, oh, okay, I have the explain explanations also. Um, here I have just copied the slide of uh, chemisorption versus physisorption. Uh, let's not go now in detail through that, but this is uh, something that I'm pre presenting also in the catalysis course. That, that's my responsibility in the uh, starting from January. So in uh, ALD we are talking about chemical adsorption. If we have physics option, that does not fulfill those criteria. So chemically specific um, chemis option as such can be reversible or irreversible, but to do the ALD we need to be on the irreversible side. Monolayer adsorption, yes. Here we see the monolayer. It's when we have chemis option, by, ne by definition, chemis option stops, stops at the monolayer. But there's going to be a difference between a chemisorbed monolayer and a monolayer of the amount that you grow. That's something that we will come back to. I have also taken here the typical chemisorption mechanisms. You might not really need to know these. Um, so we have typically... Uh, well, we can do ALD. I'm going to skip uh, jump. A bit sorry for that. Here, yes, typical reactants, precursor classes. The very first experiments in Finland, they were made with just elements. So Suntola was vaporizing zinc and sulfur and bringing those gases in contact with a substrate that was actually rotating. And that's how the first demonstrations were made. But uh, typically nowadays, elements are not used. But there are ligands around the metals that help to carry them through the gas phase. So if you think of met, um, elements as such, not so many can be evaporated to be transported. But using uh, inorganic uh, compounds, typically halides with chloride reactants or metal organics, we can transport through gas phase many more metals. Um, Alkyls, amoxides, beta dicatenates, these types for the metal precursors and for the non metal precursors, most typically the hydrides of those, uh, so or the hydrogen compounds of those, like water, ammonia, hydrogen sulfide. Also, can, you can use others. Somebody has used ethanol or hydrogen peroxide or things like this, but that's the most typical. I will not be talking today about plasma enhanced ALD uh, more, but that's where you can then also activate these types of molecules which otherwise wouldn't be reactive. So for example, nitrogen will not react to the surface, but if you split it into nitrogen um, radicals, that, those are reactive. Yeah. They are using plasma ALD, but I, I will not be talking about that more. So in this very, very typical ALD process that you must have been using, that would be trimethyl aluminium, so an organometallic uh, alkyl compound, and water as the reactants. And I will show this one also next. Um, uh, how many... ALE processes have been developed worldwide. I'm not fully sure of the situation at the moment. But when I wrote 
a collaborative review with some others. Uh, that's when more than 700 compounds or, or materials have been grown. And this table summarizes, so uh, it is a bit old. That's the status in de December 2010, and it would be good to update it. But it's a lot of work, and uh, we are not yet doing it. And I don't know who's going to do it and how. Um, but here you see that uh, if there is a black background, then the metal itself has been made metallic. And then uh, here around uh, are indicated if, if compounds with oxygen, nitrogen, and so on have been made. So from this you can read that tantalum has been made as a metal, most likely with plasma ALD, and an oxide of it, and a nitride of it, and then something else, so the compounds. So that, this is a table that merges really a lot of data together. And uh, then I'll go back to where I was, here. So, chemisorption mechanism is typical in ALD. Um, ligand exchange is called the most typical one, where you would come in with a um, metal compound that has a certain amount of organic or inorganic ligands, and it finds a reactive site on the surface, and then uh, something, typically a hydrogen atom or a proton from the surface combines with one of those ligands and leaves that's uh, shown there as the combined board. So in, in a ligand exchange reaction, you are releasing gaseous byproducts. But you don't necessarily do that. You can also just dissociate, dissociatively react or chemisorb on the surface so that all parts of the molecule stay there. Or in some cases, if the um, compound has, uh, it, it's under coordinated compared to what it wants to be, it might just want to absorb on a site. So for the TMA case, the ligand exchange reaction can be seen as release of methane, and there's also dissociation happening. Um, if you are using silicon dioxide, then you see this from the methyl groups that are bonded to silicon. So those, those have been shown to occur, and then this has been calculated also to occur in the case of DNA. Uh, growth per cycle, so sequential use of self-terminating gas-solid reactions. We are using cycles and we are repeating them. And what is the characteristic amount of material absorbed in one cycle? That's nowadays typically called the growth per cycle. Very, very simple. This is also a term that I have been advancing since 2002. You also find quite a lot of literature where people use growth rates, but it's difficult because there's no time dimension. So this is really the amount of material that you get to the surface in one cycle. It's uh, controlled by the surface, so the surface Interaction with the surface is what defines that, and we get the same amount if we use like flat substrates like silicon, or if we use porous powders. I don't have an example, but uh, for example, in catalyst preparation, we have porous powders, and there also we get the same amount if it's controlled by the same things, and the, the time can be very different. It can be a fraction of a second for here and it can be half an hour or two hours for the porous powders. So that's why the growth rate is a, is a difficult term. These are example images from that review. So um, yeah, we are, we are not able to control the amounts deposited in a continuous manner. It's in a, in a, like a digital or stepwise manner. Uh, we have a certain amount deposited per cycle. It's not necessarily constant with cycles. It can be higher, it can be lower in the beginning. Because here, in the very beginning, we start with some substrate, and we grow this material on that. And at certain times, we have both the original substrate and the material exposed, as we are not depositing a full monolayer as is a common misunderstanding for ALD that we would deposit a full monolayer per cycle. So that's something that I'm going to discuss further. Um, 
yeah, growth per cycle, basic terminology, and uh, ideally, it should be reactor independent. It should be adsorption controlled, nature controlled, depending on, of course, the the pair of chemicals that you use, so the reactants and the temperature and the substrate. So there shouldn't be other factors coming to play, but then in reality there are a little bit. But these are the main things. And now I have this uh, monolayer thing. So it's a very, very common thing to assume that you talk about atomic layer deposition, you talk about atomic layers. This gives the impression that you are depositing a monolayer per cycle. If you look in Wikipedia, also the pictures there would make you think that you deposit a monolayer per cycle. But um, in reality, rarely we have more than half of a monolayer per cycle. For this trimethyl aluminium water process, that is the most typical one, it's something like 30 to 40 percent of a monolayer. I, haven't, I don't have here a collection of, uh, of data, but you can easily create it. You can look at what has been reported in the literature and compare it to the monolayer, and you would get to that. Typically, you get something between 10 to 50 percent of a monolayer. And here is something that can make you, can help you to understand why it is. So there are different definitions for a monolayer in different cases. Here, here is a chemisorbed monolayer. Deliberately, I tried to make it look that there's a lot of space on the surface. There's a physisorbed monolayer, and then there would be like a monolayer, model monolayer, monolayer of the material that you would like to grow on top of, of another one. So for chemisorption, the definition of a monolayer comes from that all sites that react have reacted. They may be close to each other, they may be far from each other. So when they have reacted, reacted and no further reaction occurs, you have by definition a monolayer. You can look up the UBAC definitions for this International Union of Pure and Applied Sciences. You, you find it there. For physics option, the case is different. You are thinking of balls that can move loosely and they, they move next to each other to a close packing. That's when you have a monolayer. If you come from the catalysis world, then making the physics option experiments to analyze the surface area. They use that type of definition of a monolayer. But when we want to grow a layer of material on top of the other one, we don't care about these things. Those are like side steps in our project, our, our process. We actually care about this. We care about the layers on top of each other. And uh, if this would be trimethyl aluminium reacting on a surface. These would be the aluminium atoms, and these would be units with each one having one aluminium atom. So this would be after the first reaction. Then you come in with water, typically. You convert this, you remove those ligands, and you convert it to something like this, which has then again reactive sites of which groups. You see that this density of aluminium atoms can never convert to that, that type of monolayer. So even if you have a chemisorbed monolayer, after each reaction, that does not convert to a full monolayer of the amount of uh, material that we grow, because this one is ultimately defined by the reactive sites or by steric hindrance of the ligands, which are much bigger than the atoms that they carry. So this is, it's a misunderstanding that I have written about in, in the review article also. And uh, it would be nice if at least the scientists would understand <laughs> that there's no, it, it's a misunderstanding really, it's, it's mixing concepts. I understand that the layman will not grab it, but. Then also one concept to introduce is the ALD window. This is something that people talk about in many, many publications. And it's an original concept by Tuomo Suntola. It's not known that it's an original concept by him. So this is, I have been having the history of ALD as a hobby for quite some years. And uh, Suntola actually found, found back to me a slide. This is a, slant, a scanned slide from his presentation in 81. 
with a like a first version in a way of that ALD window, and then it was finished to uh, something like this, and this is the one that has been re reused by many without really referring back to this one, and that's that's a bit, but it's the same. So the idea is that there is a certain temperature range where a process works, and the process is defined by the reactants, so trimetal aluminium and water, for example, or zinc and sulfide. So there's a temperature range where the process works, and for some processes the range can be quite narrow, it can be maybe 20 uh, degrees centigrade. But, but uh, there, in that window, the uh, temperature dependency is either non-existent, having a linear, uh, having a constant growth per cycle within that window, or it's weak. I would say that these are more typical, and this is from the review. It can decrease, it can increase, it can have steps, or uh, or you can have also a more complex dependency. These, these are based on real observations. But then when you are outside of that window, then you have a strong temperature dependency, like other processes would have, like chemical vapor deposition would have a stronger, much stronger temperature dependency that is limited either by physisorption or that you have an activation energy. That chemisorption is sometimes activated. You need to, if you increase the temperature, then you are absorbing more. Decomposition, very typically, takes place when you have organic compounds that are used as reactants or re-evaporation. If we think of that trimetal aluminium water case, that one is uh, familiar with, that would follow something like this. And if you still go further, I have seen results where you are shooting up when you still go down and you are also sh shooting up when you go still up. Here you would have decomposition happening, uh, so no longer saturating reactions, but, but that the trimethyl aluminium, when it hits the surface, it decomposes. And then that at low temperatures, the reactions are so slow that, that when you increase the temperature, you speed up the reactions significantly. Okay, this we already saw. Yeah. Trimethyl aluminium water, that's nowadays considered like a model. ALD. Uh, it has not always been so, but this is something that the field agrees upon. It's not necessarily a good thing. This is not necessarily representing all processes in a, any very good way, but it's a process that, let's say, works like a train. <laughs> you can coat anything with aluminium oxide. It works very well. Trimethyl aluminium is very reactive. Also, if you expose it to air, it burns. It's dangerous. Um, so, yeah, here I have collected some references where you can find that this is a, a yeah, somehow model. So this I wrote this review that I'm repeatedly referring to that was actually about the surface chemistry of this particular process. So it has, to my understanding, influenced that the world has taken it as a representative of ALD. So all these reviews and works, they also conclude that that is the weak model. I'll come at the very end to the understanding of the chemistry here. So as I told you, you have uh, here we have the ligand exchange, we have the dissociation, we also have the association, to my understanding, working. And this is a quite a good example. It's from a recent review from colleagues in Delft. So Ruth van Ommen is one was working with ALD for catalysis, who I know well, and they have written a nice review about ALD for particles. This is one of the highly cited reviews at the moment. And uh, the presentation is full of links, so you get the PDF, and these are there, so you can explore further the things you want. I think that this is a rather good graph, because it shows the heterogeneity of the surface that you make. So many graphs, they just show that you have repeatedly the same thing always. This is a bit more realis realistic than many others uh, as graphs.
conformality of ALD was mentioned. What does conformality mean? That's what, not one of the words that we would understand right away, naturally. It's not one of the standard chemical words, is it? What does conformality mean? Any would you like to describe? Is it like the same kind of layer at every part of yeah. the coating? Yes. No thing or anything like that? Yeah, yes. Or if you have pinholes, they are the same everywhere, I would say. Yeah, so here, this is a very, very simple scheme of trying to represent something that is a complex 3D structure. In microelectronics, what you have often encountered are things that have been etched into silicon that are vertically demanding. So then you would grow a film, hoping that it goes to the bottom. But this one that I have uh, made there is supposed to represent represent the still more demanding thing. You have the lateral direction also. So if you have a line of sight technique, it will never be able to go to that cave. But a conformal film will go, and it will have the same thickness everywhere. And this is the core benefit why ALD is interesting to so many things. And here is an example. It's not a new one. So here you have those. This is silicon, and there have been trenches uh, made into it, and an ALD layer grown. And you see it is still a laminated layer. And these individual layers, they are well, one at least is less than, uh, much less than five nanometers. I think this was tantalum oxide and hafnium oxide, most likely, this one. There aren't other techniques that can do the same through gas space. But this is where ALD is unique. Um, I tried to collect to you some kind of a list which is probably not that all complete, because I was thinking of it and writing. Why to use ALD? Many people would never want to use ALD. Some people would like to use always ALD, because they love ALD, they have worked with ALD their whole life, they come from Finland, blah, blah. But that's not really a reason to use ALD, because it's not perfect. It's overall slow. If you think of the deposition, rates, so how fast you can build up a material layer, almost any technique is actually faster. And time is money. And that, of course, the slowness comes from that. The reactions stop always. You react a little bit and then it stops. Then you react again and it stops. It's much slower than any continuous process by nature. And you do need special equipment. Typically, vacuum reactors are used. You can do ALD also in atmospheric pressure. It's not that this definition of ALD does not require a vacuum. Maybe you could do it even at overpressure. But uh, in um, the constraints of reactant transport and so on have led to that the reactors operate typically under a mild vacuum of something like a millibar range. So special equipment, special chemicals, and this can be expensive. And sometimes the chemicals are toxic or hazardous otherwise. And uh, also many of the films that are produced and shared in scientific publications, they are not always so great. Um, the aluminum oxide uh, process at low temperature actually doesn't give pure aluminum oxide. There can be more than 10% of hydrogen in it. So if you want to have, have uh, aluminum oxide and you have some layer that has hydrogen and carbon, it might not fulfill your needs. So they are not, that, that people call it ALD doesn't make it perfect. But then again, there are many benefits. Um, so even if ALD is slow, you can scale it easily because you don't have to have the same flux everywhere. So already the, the very first uh, industrial application of ALD, making these electroluminescent displays, that has had big reactors where you have 
many plates in the same reactor uh, running, I think, three days for one run, but having, I think, hundreds of plates. So that's how you can scale it up. And that's what is being done also in microelectronics. They have big furnaces, batch furnaces, where they can have 200 wafers of silicon at the same time. And it's very reproducible. So in principle, from equipment to equipment, you should get the same results. If you are going to very fine details, I think this will also be challenged. But in principle, following the definition, this should be true. I wrote here the excellent nucleation control. And this was, to my understanding, why the very first application, these electroluminescent displays, actually worked with ALD better than with other methods. So ALD is called deposition, and not everybody likes that. It's actually growth, if you see it otherwise. We don't deposit from the, from, from the top, like snow coming down, like some CV processes. They actually, you can have gas-based reactions that then deposit. But ALD grows from the surface. And that's why, uh, in the case of the crystallizing sulfide films that were needed, you started to grow high-quality crystalline films very, very quickly, more quickly than with uh, physical vapor deposition methods. So actually, the crystalline quality there was better. Then, um, what is also important in the application that you have in all your electronic um, devices, there the uh, so so-called gate oxide is nowadays hafnium-based material, which replaces silicon dioxide. On silicon, you have the thermal silicon dioxide, which grows naturally, but that has been discarded and replaced by a higher dielectric constant material that has to be thin, I think, less than two nanometers. And there, then, these uh, properties of how the film grows in the very very few few first layer is very important. And uh, okay, the high optimized layer quality, so in, in industrial applications, they do optimize it much further than in the research, research grade in a way. So the layer quality can be very high and then this uh, conformality is one of the big driving things. So many people find reason to use ALD, and many also not. And yeah, where do we have ALD? Now that Suntala got this uh, Millennium Technology Prize, now this message is going through everywhere. In every smartphone, you have ALD. I'm really happy that this is uh, now like penetrating people's understanding, but I do think that it's slow. And I have tried to dig out a bit more in detail. Like, what is it in our mobile phones that is there? I'll come back to that. That story is not full. So I'm aware of uh, logic chips and uh, mem memory chips and multiple patterning, but I don't know the components of the mobile phone well enough to be able to say that it's here and there and there. But I've asked people who are more knowledgeable than myself, so I will come with some answers a bit later. I promised to uh, tell you about the history of ALD. So a fact is that ALD has been independent, uh, discovered or come up with independently twice. And once it happened here um, in Espoo, Tuomas Untola um, came up with a technique with the purpose of making electroluminescent displays. And this is what we are proud of. We are happy of, and I wouldn't be doing this what I'm doing if Suntola did not come up with the technique. Um, another time has been pretty close by also, in St. Petersburg. How far is that? 400 kilometers, 450, something like that. There was an academic group working on ALD already in the 60s. They didn't call it ALD. Suntola also didn't call it ALD. Suntola called it Atomic layer epitaxy, uh, these guys, uh, Valentin Alexkovsky and Stanislav Kaltsov, they called it, they didn't call it molecular layering, they called it molecular yarnaya naslaivanie. 
and that's translated as molecular layering. So of course they were communicating in Russian and uh, they were in USSR. And Shona's uh, work was not uh, published, it was patented. It was also patented in, in USSR. And even though we, from, from the current eyes, we see that it's the same technique, they were working with so different applications. They were working with powders to start from, but also with silicon and germanium and things like that. Um, but they were calling it a different thing. Suntala came up with the reactors and with an application. There was so little overlap that even the patenting people in USSR didn't notice that there's that this, it's the same. So this first patent, I think it has been granted in 25 countries or so, and uh, Suntola has been in, in Moscow to defend it in the 70s, and that's, that's how it went. It's much later that uh, people have realized that it's the same. And um, virtual project on the history of ALD. This is uh, the core of my history hobby for five years already. It's an activity that we started together with a few other scientists to, to find out about the early days, especially the Russian side, because we didn't know, know about it and we wanted to know really the facts. Like if I go back, there's a question mark over there. What is the layering? Question mark, 1965. We don't know really. So this activity was started. We are collecting all old ALD literature up to year 86. Um, it's volunteer based, so if there's somebody here who would like to join, this activity is still open. We have produced four scientific papers and there's one review article still to be written in big collaboration. And um, history is sensitive and emotional, that's what I have found. So it was for me actually, when I wrote my doctoral thesis in 2002, I have written there that ALD was invented by Suntola. I had heard the name molecular layering, but I didn't know it's so old. There was no review article that would have described it. So when I learned a little bit later that it is really the same technique and it was older, this, this game gave me a, not a peaceful feeling inside. I, I felt like I, I had done something wrong in my thesis. I, I wanted my thesis to be perfect. <laughs> so that's one of the reasons why I wrote the review article also that I have been referring to with the basics. That also goes through the history. So this virtual project on the history, it's kind of a continuation of earlier history activities. And we chose to do it with colors of grey. So not, not to, you know, put blue or red or anything because that would give people, you know, they feel that somebody is promoted and another one not. It's all in shades of grey. And we also came up with a slogan that if we do it in atmosphere of openness, respect and trust. And these are quite good guidelines. We have the St. Petersburg professors also working together with us. Without them, we wouldn't be able to find out about the early details there. But it's sometimes difficult to discuss. They see the things from really a different perspective. And of course, they, they are not happy with that people haven't known about them. People haven't cited their papers, for example. A scientist likes to be cited. So there are many, many things that, uh, that uh, we take into account and uh, this whole thing has been progressing very, very nicely and uh, helping to know about the history. Now I can share about that also here. And the whole activity started actually from a question. Making research questions is something that we need to do when we are at the doctoral study level. I don't know if some of you are, but coming up with good questions is the starting point of coming up with good answers. So this, this uh, started actually from a question, what are the molecular layering papers by Balzo from early 1960s? This was a claim that was being made in, the, in Wikipedia and so on. And this started the whole thing. It was not meant to start the activity, but it cre created quite lively discussion in SlideShare in, in, uh, in LinkedIn. So that, that many comments you typically don't have. So people had a lot of opinions and 
it started progressing. And uh, now I'm going to scroll through some of the learnings. So what was the first article? I was sitting together with Tuomas Untola discussing. He, actually, I wanted to know about the Russian stuff, but he started to tell about the Finnish stuff. And then I realized that even that hadn't been properly written down. So then I wrote an essay that has been published. And there are also these very first experiments to make the electroluminescent zinc sulfide doped with manganese. Some people didn't see this yet. So here we have a transparent uh, electroluminescent display. There's zinc sulfide doped with manganese making this uh, color. So those uh, and uh, the scheme there is to reproduce the very first experiments with the rotating reactor. That's all written down and an exhibition was also made in uh, 2014. You can look at all, all of this if you want. Here is an iconic picture. This is a collaborator of Thomas Untala who passed out was it last year. There's an uh, well, Suntala wrote a very, very nice uh, how is it called? Obituary for him. Um, a person without really any um, academic education, but very, very valuable in, in building the reactors. Here are learnings from the history project, and I have, uh, not all of them are relevant to you and this course, just the ones that are in green, I think that you could be aware of. So the very first um, demonstrator of electroluminescent displays, it was an information display board at the Helsinki Vantaa airport. It consisted of these uh, character modules, and uh, it was installed in 83 and it was for 15 years in, in use without any of those character modules failing. And uh, now since then it has been uh, replaced with other things. That's something you could remember from the Finnish history. And uh, two years or so after this, that's when the production really started. Molecular layering. People talk about frame, framework hypothesis as an ancestor of molecular layering and it took quite a long time before I found out what is this hypothesis and there you have it, that's the matrix hypothesis. It looks like a powder, doesn't it? it you can imagine they have been working with powders and thinking of, for example, silicon dioxide consisting of some framework and functional sites from which you can build or which you can remove. So that has been the basic of their work, very different than, than here in Finland. We haven't found out anything that would be older than 65, <coughs> so that's for the question of the history project. Uh, first, first documented report is from 65, and they worked, for example, with catalysis quite early, and that's relevant to me because this is something that I want to work with. They have their own USSR author's invention from 72 already. And uh, okay, here's Professor Prost, who met Suntala in year 90 and myself in 2013. He built thinium re reactors already in the 70s also. Massive list of doctoral theses. There's something like 50 theses from from uh, USSR or Russia. I never had time to go through them, what they are, all of them, but it's, it's a lot. Uh, not too long ago, that was in October, I was in Mexico giving a talk about learnings from this uh, history project. You can find, if you are interested, you can scroll through it. If there are all links, it's all openly shared. And this is the list of uh, scientific articles that has been produced so far. So I was already mentioning my own one of Suntala's work. Then our Russian collaborators, they have written a, a similar essay of their part, and this is something I'm really happy that they did. It. And then with 62 co-authors, we have created a recommended reading list of early AMD papers that was made by voting through our list because there are more than 300 papers listed. Nobody can read them all, so you have to start somewhere that helps with that. 
And then I wrote an ECS transactions paper related to that invited talk of the learnings. These are maybe for doctoral students who, who work with the topic. And we have also created a list of doctoral theses in this uh, BPHA virtual project on the history of ALP. And you see most, the, the highest number of theses comes from Finland, then USSR, Russia, USA, and there are many others. And there are certainly some information missing also, and we are going to fill this to the status at the end of this year, and then I hope we'll put it in a review and publish. But if you see, for example, in, in Kemia Lehti, Tuomas uh, was interviewed, I saw it yesterday, he says that there are 400 theses worldwide. This is where that information comes from. Nobody had collected such information before. And it's also not, not properly published <coughs> yet, but it is accessible through the website. We are doing it as an open science thing. And because there is this project, and I'm favoring open science in principle, that has made me an interesting person here at Aalto University, because open science is a concept that is being discussed and promoted, but nobody does it. So I have done something, and then, then I'm uh, suddenly very interested in the so in this uh, open science means that it's, the information is there for everybody to see in real time, even when it's not completed yet. And also an ALD timeline, oh, it would be nice to have one, and uh, there, there isn't one that would be kind of fully accepted or so, and this is also not such, this is one that I have made from my perspective, but I would like to make a better one in the history project, so in the 60s, USSR first record in the 70s in Finland and then the rest has been put here and uh, yeah to be improved. Um, progress was not so very quick uh, in the first decades but now since 2000 to 2010s there's big activity in the world. We tried to estimate how many ALD reactors would there be and we came with the number of something like 10,000, most likely. And that brings us nicely to industrial applications. Would you like to have a break of five minutes? Would somebody have a need or shall we just continue? You can handle sitting for a moment still. I will just have to. Okay. Yeah, AV in industrial applications. We we would love to know about those, wouldn't we? But it's not so easy. It's not so easy. People don't want to tell. They have no obligation to tell. Researchers, we publish. We research, we publish. Industry. They are so silent as they can. So there was, uh, some time ago, Mikko Ritala and Jaakko Niinistö wrote um, a publication, Industrial Applications of Atomic Layer Deposition. And that's where they, well, it's a good article, it's an interesting one, but they also had clearly met this. It's a strategical decision to keep the use of ALDC. People don't want to share. And also there was very recently an interview of Markus Pusund in Teklehti in Finnish. And if I translate, well, if some uh, semiconductor manufacturer would take this type of passivation layer in use, they wouldn't tell you. So it's not so easy to tell about these applications, but ALD is big enough that there are these market research companies that approach it from a different angle. And you find these numbers if you search for the market size. So the sales of ALD equipment yearly. I have seen from different sources uh, estimations that that is something like one and a half billion US dollars. 
not million, but billion. And I saw when I was looking for growth numbers, and again a, a report expecting that in less than 10 years the, the market has doubled. So it is more than one billion uh, dollar yearly market, and the growth numbers that I've seen they are something like 30 percent per year. So it's in strong go growth. It has been like that all the time since I worked with ALD. I started in '98. And uh, then I did my doctoral studies. I graduated in 2002. And ALDs was so much growing that I thought that I don't want to leave this field. I want to see where it go goes. And it has been growing all the time since. It has to level off somewhere. Are we now getting to that place? I don't know. Also, what I've heard, what I didn't put here, is that the uh, chemicals, ALD chemicals market size is something like 400 million US dollars per year. And usually these market studies, they assume that the, the value of the products that you made is, make is like a thousand times more. But you can imagine if ALD is in your pocket, it must be a, the, the whole semiconductor field is of course worth much more. Also, this may give a view on the market. Don't memorize this list. <laughs> um, I collected a list of companies that are selling ALD reactors. This I did uh, last summer when I was writing a, a nomination letter for the Millennium Technology Prize. So this was valid then. I think that some of these companies likely don't exist anymore, and there are some new ones, but this was what I knew then and still probably incomplete at that time. So there are three companies marked with the Finnish flags, Benek and Picosan, they operate fully here in Finland. And Benek is the one who provided that demo. And then ASM, that's a leading semiconductor um, equipment producer. They have their ALD research unit here in Finland. And one of those people who have uh, presented here in this uh, uh, course has, uh, comes from ASM. So they have a small research group, less than 20 people here. They have their headquarters in uh, the Netherlands and production new facilities in the US. It's a big company, but they have Finnish roots and uh, they still keep their research unit here. I guess thanks to ALD being so strong in Finland. Also, another way to approach the industrial applications. This is, Benek has since some time a really good blog series. They are writing very nicely and this is one of their blogs where they are reporting that 27 of Fortune 100 companies are Benek customers. You can look up this list of what those companies are and you cannot say which ones use ALD and which ones don't, but this is a really large fraction of world top companies doing some secret things with ALD. Okay, I was thinking, what kinds of uh, properties do people go after with ALD? So, conformality comes in any case. Um, I am aware of these types. Electrical, isolation, control leakage, conduction, high dielectric constant. So, for example, here in this demo, you have the isolating uh, layers and you have conducting zinc, zinc sulfide. Um, Optical, transparent, uh, sorry, that's a, a spelling mistake, should be a high refractive index, low refractive index, luminescent here, or chemical with resistance to given surroundings, or control release in lithography as a mask, so that's also chemical resistance to something. It could be morphologically interesting, and I think that this list could be continued. And here I have some words of conformality. More. So this is actually from our recent paper. I don't know if you have even seen this. We had Paulina Voigt as a um, master's thesis work. Uh, we tried to uh, work towards catalysts, putting nickel throughout zirconia particles. And here is a um, scan through the particle showing that we have nickel even in the center. 
not necessarily the same amount everywhere, but uh, this is a case of extreme conformality. This is a um, submitted paper and the preprint is openly shared. So you can have a look already if you like. I hope we get it, get it accepted too. Here um, are some DRAM related things and uh, so that would be related, these are related to memory components. So earlier people were making these vertical holes to increase surface area. Nowadays, in addition to making vertical holes, they are still making like, lateral connections here. These uh, memory components are becoming just extremely complex and I don't know the exact details, but they are actually getting to that conformality figure that, that was there. Not only filling these vertical gaps, but filling these uh, lateral ones additionally. That's something that is reality in the semiconductor world at the moment. Electroluminescent flat panel displays, that was the first application of ALD. As you know, here are some examples. Here is an explanation that has been published here in this uh, paper that was already mentioned. You have here a black background, you have passivation, you have electrodes, you have uh, insulators, you have a luminescent layer, aluminium oxide, uh, then mixed aluminium titanium dioxide. And where do they use these displays? So in the early 80s, there was no flap displays anywhere yet. And Suntala worked in a company called Instrumentarium that were making medical devices. And actually the view then was to create small displays for a hospital environment. They have small displays that don't take so much space there. And they were competing with uh, this, um, how is this display now called, this flat one? Sorry, I can't remember. Liquid crystal display. So in principle, competing for the same market, but of course these ones are much, much cheaper. So the electroluminescent ones don't compete for the same applications. But they are very robust. You can use them at minus 50, you can use them at high temperature. Like these uh, displays in the Helsinki Vantaa airport, they stayed 15 years without breaking. I cannot imagine that this <laughs> display here would do the same. And uh, I learned this uh, one application very recently. For example, the new Airbus uh, airplanes use these displays. So when um, an airplane lands, they start to do the service for the water management, letting out the dirty water, putting in the, the good water, and they, they do that very quickly. And they have a display that is not inside the pressurized side of the airplane, but it's outside, so it experiences minus 50 and uh, lower pressure when the airplane is, is uh, moving and then it lands and it's operational right away. So I think this is a very, very nice example of where they are in practice used. Then there's this uh, demo of the transparent um, displays. I think it's exactly the same as in the picture. They brought it to me this week. And where is this one used? Well, when it was bought by Chinese um, investors not too long ago, and I understand that one of the reasons that they are interested are these transparent displays. What I was given as an example is that Finnish tractors are going to have these in their classes from next year on, and there's a link that you can go on and find more information about it if you like. And also I got this uh, SEM image, a cross-section of what we have. So um, you have the glass substrate, alumina layer, uh, indium titanium dioxide. This is a, conductor, a transparent conductor, not made by ALT. Then you have the aluminum oxide titanium dioxide layer. Then you have the electroluminescent crystalline layer. And again, insulator and conductor. That's how it looks like. It's the same thing as the not transparent, except that the, the outsides are different. And there's also a more detailed scheme of what it is. But uh, if you are interested, you can have a look at this later. Um, yeah, so ALD is in your smartphone. 
I'm when I saw that uh, Alto University magazine work, I, I understand that I have also promote, been promoting this picture, but my uh, my knowledge is not reaching far away enough. I know it's in the memory component, I know it's in the logics, I know it's used as a sacrificial layer in lithography. But where exactly? So I asked Twitter. We have a quite active um, community in Twitter. It's like a continuous conference. That's great. I recommend. Don't start behaving bad. <laughs> um, yeah, Twitter knows first. This is a slogan that I, I sign. So I was asking, hello, ALD tweets a question. Where exactly do we have ALD in the smartphone component? So I was tweeting that slide of mine and I got very, very nice answers by Jonas Sundqvist, old engineer. I know him very well and he has been giving these uh, nice links and these are all links so you can click this and you get to the Twitter feed and you can follow if there has been discussion if you are interested. Um, High K Metal Gate he mentions. Um, here we have a little bit more on that. High K Metal Gate. There are actually two um, functions that are not maybe very visible here. Here you would have a silicon substrate. There is a um, doped conductive band in the center and on top of that you have somewhere you have the high K dielectric and on top of that you have a conductor that is used to control this uh, CMOS transistor and uh, this is also showing the when I was working at IMAC we were working with this exactly this but uh, we didn't have a 3D uh, uh, dimension there yet we were working still with flat planar, planar substrate so with silicon putting there a layer of hafnium oxide or zirconium oxide or some mixes of those and then experimenting with titanium dioxide for example as a conductor or also with polysilicon but since then they have to squeeze the, the function to still smaller area and they have started to go vertical and they call this the fin like a shark has a fin at the back that's where this fin pet comes from so since uh, the field moved to this fin pet, in addition to having the high K metal gate function, there is also double patterning. And I'm not going to go in details of this, but I will just refer you to this one if you are interested. So the sizes are nowadays so small, we, they are talking of 8 nanometer or whatever technology or 20 nanometer if you think of the wavelength of light that, so these structures they are made by lithography they are made with light and uh, the people are doing all tricks they can make to, to focus the light to smaller wavelengths than the light actually has and going to UV light is, is one uh, deep UV that would be one step further but they actually ALD has helped to uh, not to have to do that, and that is the <coughs> double patterning and the multiple patterning uh, thing that you can probably read about more in that blog post if you are interested. That that's a uh, silicon dioxide, and maybe silicon nitride uh, films that are made by plasma ALD, and that's one of the things that nowadays is contributing a lot to these big numbers in the ALD equipment sales actually. So there, ALD doesn't remain there as a functional component, but it's, it's used for lithography. And since those FinFET times, this is where the industry has moved. This is very recent, it's from this November. Samsung makes 3 nanometer gate all around CMOS. This has been reported not too long ago, and here we have the, like the FinFET thing going up and still there are three on top of each other somehow they I can't even explain how this functions you, if you are interested you need to dig out more but there's 
like Janusson, this says beautiful ALD all around. So these layers that are there around, that's why ALD. So this is um, CMOS, it's the logics, it's the brains. Um, so ALD has actually kept the Moore's law going with this. And this is an excellent article, if you are interested, you can read that. I think that that still says that it's a hafnium-based oxide that they are using. I know the process. I know the material and the process, but I will not tell you because I haven't seen it written anywhere. I can privately discuss, but not here in class. So they keep it a secret. And here is one more slide. This is also from Jonas Sundqvist, the bold engineer. Number of ALD passes per wafer going through that uh, processing. So I was at IMEC. We, we were working with, I think, these technology nodes. I was there 2003, 2004. Number of ALD passes was very small then. But you see that that has been increasing really a lot. <coughs> There are those patterning steps, for example, included. And this explains the growth of that equipment market as well. Is it like how many times the ALD is being used in the manufacturing process? Yes, so a wafer moves in a process. How many steps would it have? If there's already 30 steps of ALD, that's probably 200 steps of everything. And a wafer can cost how much? 60,000 euro or 200,000 euro, I don't know. One wafer that is going there in a foundry. You don't want to drop it as an operator. And still they sometimes do. So logics, so this like the brain of, of the computer, that's one thing. Memory chips, this is where ALD entered the production actually a bit earlier. So 2007 was when Intel started using ALD for this high-K application and others have followed. But even before, in uh, the memory components, the, the DRAMs, that's where ALD has been used. And the reason there is that people have uh, increased the surface area of those uh, memory components by going vertical. And that has already required the use of ALD. And there, ALD has been in use quite a long time. And here, Jonas has also reported that double patterning has been used there a long time. I, I wasn't really aware of that, but I believe he's, he has been working in this Infineon who made the DRAMs in 2000s. And this I learned by answers to my Twitter question. So the MEMS. Gyro, gyroscope also has ALD. I don't know in what function, but I, I believe, I see these SD microelectronics people also at ALD conferences. I know some of them. There's also one contributing to the history project, so I believe they use it, but I don't know how. And still things that I learned from Twitter. In the camera, there's DRAM and ALD. Uh -huh. Modem, there's ALD data, still something more. So this is what I found. Okay, then coming to something more easily understandable. So something that is being done in Finland since 2004 is protecting silver uh, jewelry against darkening. So against darkening forces. So silver jewelry, it gets dark with time, and that's because of the influence of, I think, oxygen and sulfur from the air. And it's the same ubiquitous uh, aluminum oxide process that is being used to coat these so that the silver jewelry stays shiny while it is in the shop. This uh, thin aluminum oxide layer is, is not enough to, to uh, not to wear out if you wear the jewelry, but it is enough to keep the, the jewelry good looking when it is in the shop. So this is being used. And uh, I understand that ALD is also being used in the watchmaking industry. And I don't know for what purposes. But uh, there is a Picosan uh, press release. I say here, probably reliable. I do think that they have grounds for making that. But no, no details for application. 
And uh, there was uh, very, very recently the, uh, how is it called, the satellite Bepi Colombo was sent to Mercury. And Mikko Ritala from the University of Helsinki was uh, sharing again in Twitter, which is a great source of information. The most far-reaching ALE application is about to go. And then there was some discussion, yeah, how is this related to AOD? And uh, he was sharing, I think I know the company has made, who has made this. Iridium coated microchannel plate for X-ray focusing. I think it's a local, local company that has made this. And here, to my understanding, also conform of Iridium layers have been needed. Sorry that I'm not the expert on this each application, but I, I cannot be, but I'm still like, exci excited actually to know myself these things. Yeah, when I was preparing this lecture, I was thinking to myself, how on earth do I know whether I'm preparing a suitable amount of uh, material? Will I take much too much time? Or, but I think now that we are coming to the last part, we are uh, no time. Yeah, I promised to say something about the future as well. But how can you say things about the future? What, what can we actually know? We can only guess. So, uh, yeah, playing the wizard here a little bit, thinking of where things are going to go. This guy is the wizard of Oz. I don't know if you know the book, but it's a very good one. Yeah. I'm completely sure that this uh, microelectronics growth will not stop. That has been boosting the ALD research in the last decades, and I would expect that to continue. I don't know if it's as fast as it has been. There is also a shift now in the microelectronics. They have been uh, gotten very interested in atomic layer etching, which is conceptually quite similar as ALD. But instead of adding materials layer by layer, you are removing materials layer by layer. So the international ALD conference is actually for a few years, it has a, it is this ALD conference, but next to it, it accommodates also an atomic layer etching event. So they go together, they share a lot. Yeah, I expect that to continue. And the good thing is that if we want to, for example, work with catalysis, we can utilize a lot of that information that they are generating. That's an opportunity. Catalysis, here I had too little time to, to uh, share something meaningful, really, but this is something that uh, I'm myself interested in. And in my viewpoint, ALB has, you know, it was used in USSR already in the 70s. In Bulgaria, there was activities then. In Finland, there was big activity on this in the 90s. So that was related to microchemistry and Suntola works and so on. So they really tried to make industrial catalysts by ALD. That phased out. My doctoral thesis was related to that, like the second forthcoming of uh, ALD for catalysis. If you now search the literature, you find that the US uh, researchers and the Chinese researchers are leading. So I see that it's like the third, fourth coming, and now it's global. And I would like to be back in that business in a way. Finland hasn't been very strong in that. And I feel like we are starting a little bit from, not from, from the zero, but from not so very high either. And uh, so my area is catalysis, and I will give a lecture on this if somebody is interested in the spring. And there's also the lecture of last year, so ALD for catalysis. I'm, I'm willing to share all these slides and so on for those who are interested. Um, something that is moving in the last years is ALD for pharmaceutical applications and medical in general. I'm not aware if there are any commercial applications yet, but I know, do know that there's a startup in Sweden that uh, somehow commercializes ALD, um, I think, for the controlled release of medicine. I think so. And there's a startup in Finland by people actually who are working in the US where they want to work with 
pharmaceutical powders and affect their flow properties with ALD. And uh, protective biocompatible layers, this is something that uh, there was a project already while I was at VTT investigating these things in a European Union project. From Grenoble, there was also a doctoral thesis on the topic. So this is something that is moving. Whether something big will come out of that, we will have to see. Um, conformality, as we know, is, is the stronghold of AOD. But it has been difficult to test. So, so far, and when I was at BTP, we only had these types of structures where the aspect ratio that we could make was something like 40 to 1. And uh, this is not so very demanding for ALD. So the limit where ALD starts to perform really well is something like 50 to 1. So CVD processes can also get some to something like this, but if you need to go beyond, that's where ALD is strong. But if your test structures go to 40 to 1, how do you know? So that's where I wanted to create test structures where you can really see how the ALD layers perform. And I was working with microelectromechanical systems and we were making test structures going to 10,000 to 1 and even higher uh, with the idea that when you then grow ALD, no film will ever go to the bottom and you can always see differences. So the film will coat everything from the outside and then from this gap where the height is well defined. It can only go to a certain place and then you can analyze how it performs. So we have made these and I have a demo chip here with me. And I think and I hope that this will progress the field. We have a modeling paper out this year with uh, Marco Ulilami and my colleague Oli Ulivara from VTT. And these chips are available. I can use them in my research and VTT is promoting them for others also. I'm, I'm writing a review article with uh, Belgian scientists. And uh, that's all about um, characterizing, characterizing the conformality. And uh, I see that when you are able to analyze these these uh, lateral test structures, and you get to this, uh, this saturation profile inside. So it's expected that you would have a constant thickness in the beginning, where you have this saturated growth. At some point, you decrease, and you should maybe go to zero. If you analyze this, you can understand a lot of the kinetics of the process also. I hope that this is going to boost the ALD field, and maybe the atomic layer etching also. I don't know. I'm quite excited of this myself, and this is why I have been invited to give talks at EMRS, for example, many places. This is something where there's a lot of interest. So I, I think that's, that's for the future. I hope that's, that's something that will happen. Yeah, TMA water. That's the process that works on anything. It's used by almost all groups. But how does it work? The very first article was from, I think, 89. And already there, the scientists from US who were reporting it said that it's, it's very easy to understand how this in principle works. We have the methyl groups, we have the hydrogen from the OH, and they combine and they release methane. But you only get one Armstrong per cycle, and that's something like 30% of a monolayer. Where does that number come from? They didn't understand. This is a question that is intriguing me. Where, why do we have this certain thing, certain number? And I have been thinking of that a lot. And this is, um, I also gave a talk two years ago at the ALD conference, comparison of interpretations on the surface chemistry of the, this process. And uh, OK, it's the model system. And then I'm comparing here the views in different preview articles that conclude that this is a model system. How do they see these things? And even the amount of methyl groups on the surface, when you look at that as function of temperature, these reviews interpret different things. So the fact is that I did a big job for my review on this process to go through all the literature. But 
in the AOD literature, it's not at a very high level to cite back others. And also, these guys haven't really been, they haven't maybe even noticed this progress that was made. So people basically have been citing their own works and not looking at the whole field. So here I did look at the big picture, concentrating only on the reviews and seeing that the, the results are really different. And those slides are shared. And then also last year uh, from Eindhoven, the group, they also questioned a lot of the, the interpretations made. And Charles Winter is a professor from US, very at the very, very uh, high level of reactant development. He gave a tutorial at the ECS, ECS conference, conference where I was, and his conclusion was that this is the best understood process. There are really different views depending on who you discuss with. But my, at least in this month, they say that they are debating the, uh, um, the surface chemistry interpretations. So, yeah. Let's conclude that there is debate on this, and it's a good thing. Debate belongs in science. So what is agreed upon is that this is a model system, but the field does not agree on the mechanisms, and that means that there is work to do, and that's a good thing. And also, as a note for the future, well, I just said that maybe, maybe in the field we haven't been citing others so very well, and this is one of the conclusions, actually from my very recent ECS transactions paper that, yeah, it has happened many times in the field of ALD that I see that people get very upset that, you know, their, their work has not been cited even though they were, you know, it should be. I've experienced it myself and the most drastic occurrence is those Russian researchers who also came up with ALD and uh, before my review in 2005 Nobody has ever given them the credit. People know of that since the year 1990. So it was still the time of USSR and Viktor Brost, whose picture was also on one of the slides, he actually came to the conference that was organized in Espo by Professor Lauri Niinistö. He managed to come and he was sharing, there's a full, full paper in the uh, proceedings of that conference, mentioning also Hathmin Oxide, which Jump a bit further, if you remember, in your computers, you have it. They have done also significant works. Maybe that didn't lead to industrial applications, but from scientific point of view, it's relevant. It's just as relevant as anything else. And this is something that I would like to... I don't know if I'm able to change how the field is, but I try a bit. And try to do a good work myself, but of course, everybody makes mistakes. Time to conclude. I hope that you agree with me that you have understood ALD is a growing and a transitioning field. ALD has been called a multi-tool of nanotechnology, and that's how I feel it is. It's one of it's a grassroots level thing. You never see it. It's an invisible thing. It's a it's a tool, it's like a Swiss army knife. You take it, you can do so many things with that. Um, there is a link also to, to this Millennium Technology Prize uh, information from Finland.fi. This is where you find my quotes also. So when this prize was coming, there was somebody from the foreign ministry coming to interview me. That's very nice. I think my quotes are available in Chinese also. You could check. <laughs> And uh, yeah, ALD has been invented twice independently. This is a fact and we should be aware of that and not, not try to forget it. And if you want to remember something of the applications, well, for example, for the exam that you will have, electroluminescent displays, that's the first Finnish um, application, you should be aware of that. And another significant one is also that ALD has enabled the continuation of Moore's law. That's very, very significant. That's why somebody actually who was, I met a foreigner uh, in the, having lunch with a colleague. I think he was from the Netherlands and he told me that, yeah, ALD put Finland on the map. 
that was how he interpreted it. So I think worldwide it's a bit bigger than people think in Finland. And as a final thing, I have collected to you some faces of ALD in Finland. So those who are doing research on ALD could be aware of these people, of course. Thomas Untola, Sven Lindfors, Markku Leskela and Mikko Ritola are professors at the University of Helsinki. Markku Leskela has graduated from here, the predecessor of Aalto University, the Helsinki University of Technology. And uh, Mikko Ritola has been his first student and they collaborate some time together. Professor Hele Sabin has got, gotten some prizes also for where he has, she has, um, she's working with solar panels where ALD is also being applied to increase the efficiency. Maren Karpinen, um, doing all kinds of things with hybrid layers, for example, for all myself. And then I have here two bonus faces, who are not Finns, but who have strong connections to Finland. Professor Jean Barry, who is going to visit Aalto quite soon to be interviewed for the SPG podcasts made by some students. He has been working in the lab of Leskela and Ritala, and uh, yeah, he knows Finland very well. And here is Dr. Jonas Sundqvist. You may recognize the logo. This is the guy who was kindly answering my Twitter uh, questions. He is also born in Finland. He has lived in Sweden, but he's born in Finland, so I thought it's appropriate to put his face here also. And there are these companies, ASN Bennett Picosson, and now that there's a list of faces, somebody's going to be upset for not being there. There are hundreds of more people in Finland working with ALD. I have here also collected some additional information that you can scroll through if you like, if you are interested, but no need to go through this. Okay, I come to the end of this. Let's stop the recording. Let's hope that it worked.